Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from Messiah, Lord of all. He became sin, who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. So amazing, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the cup, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah.
Jesus, thank you so much. Father God, we pray for every heart in here, God. You are after our hearts, God. Let us not forget that, Lord. You are a jealous God. You are a jealous God who desires that we worship you and love you and that we put you first in our hearts, that you sit on the throne of our hearts, Father. Right now, God, we pray for um, that you may open the eyes and ears and hearts of every individual here, God, to receive your word, to receive your truth, to open up their Bibles and read, not just be fed, but to, to find you themselves, God, to seek and ask questions, God. You are faithful in that. You say that when we seek you with all our hearts, we will find you, Father. So let us not be afraid to come to the throne of grace, Father. Let us worship. Let us receive your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys may be seated. Yeah. All right. Thank you, team. Dan Chong. All right, guys. I'm, I'm Carol. I'm the interim pastor here for those of you that are, that are new to the church. But you're in for a treat today. Hunter is going to be preaching. We're starting off our sermon series. Oh, that's... Well, you can't walk, you can't leave now that I said you're preaching after this, so. Um, I don't know, that, I can always, always anticipate Hunter doing what I didn't expect, so. Oh, good, he's not leaving, all right, so, because I am not ready to preach today. Hey, just a few announcements before we get into our sermon today. Um, and if you notice that the, the music set was a little short, just trust me, hold on, okay? All right, it's, again, Hunter's preaching today, so who knows what's going to happen. Uh, so just a couple of things today. First, uh, for regular attenders and, uh, and members, we want to remind you that you can give to the church a number of different ways. Uh, we have a QR code that you can use to, to give. It's right here on the, on the back wall here, so you can use that to go and give online. If you're old school like me, I still love the thing of writing out a check. It's the only check I write out ever is to the, to the church. But uh, you can do that, put it in the, in the envelope in the seat back, and then it goes to the boxes by the doors. Or you can text to give if you want to. But again, for, and for guests, this is something we never ask you guys to give. It's never a requirement to be a part of, of Fresno Church. It's just something we do out of our uh, thankfulness to God for, for his blessings and what he's done and our obedience to, to his word. So that's what we do expect from members. But guests, we're just glad to have you. Your presence here is our gift today to, that you give to us. Uh, speaking of that, though, guests, if you have not... We'd love you to grab a connection card from the seat back in front of you and fill that out, please. We'd love to get your, your contact information, so we can just thank you for being here today. We will not spam you. We will not put you on a mailing list unless you ask, but we do just want to connect with you after the service just to know how your experience was today. So if you can use that, that connection card can also be used for prayer requests. And so you can do prayer requests there, or you can use the QR code and the, on the... the um, Actually, the Connect QR code, I believe, over there will take you to, uh, to our connection cards. And we want to know if you've got a prayer request, anything like that, we'd love to have it. And if you check that it's okay to share, we will share it on our prayer list on Wednesday nights at our regular prayer meeting. So please, we want to encourage you to do that. One other thing we hadn't mentioned in a while, and I believe it's also in this QR code right here, that will take you to a, we have an, a website most of you may not know. Our regular website is fresnochurch.com. I think we also have fresno.church. We've got a lot of websites out there. They all go to the same place, but we've got an interesting one called fresnochurch.info. That's only good on mobile devices. It won't work on your computer. But if you go there, you can actually get notes from Hunter's sermon today. So you can take your phone. It's, you know, we, now we don't want you shopping on Amazon, uh, Amy, so don't be doing any shopping or anything during this time. But, but if you want to go to fresnochurch.info and be able to uh, follow along in the sermon notes, you can do that at this point. And then we have one last thing. All right, a lot of Q, these QR cards will take you a lot of places. Um, so I think this one is the QR code here. But I want to let you know we're starting small groups this week. We're starting a sermon series on... All right. Right. Your time comes in like a minute and a half, okay? Just give me a moment, all right? Oh, man. All right. So starting small groups this week. And so some of you already signed up, but there's a couple of ways to sign up. First, you can use that QR code to go and sign up for a small group right now. There's several small groups. There's one Thursday night here at the church that's open to anybody. There's one Thursday night at Twyla and Ruben's house that will be that's up by uh, uh, just north of Herndon so up that way 
We've got one on Wednesday night at Hunter and Rachel's house. Hunter is our worship guy that you just saw there. So it'll be Wednesday night at their house. Then we have a Tuesday night meeting over in our neighborhood over here at Marlene and Steve's house. So uh, we'll give you directions, all those things. These meetings last about an hour and a half, and here's what they do. It's a chance for you to connect with people and get to know them better because let's be honest, in the services, most of the time you're listening, you're singing together, but you're not really connecting with each other. We're connecting with God. And so the only time we really connect on Sunday morning is before and after services. And I know some of you guys, you come in late, you gotta dash out early because you gotta beat the Methodist or you gotta beat North Point to the, you know, to Panera Bread or wherever it is you're heading that day, all right? So you dash out of here to make it there. And we don't make those connections. Small groups where you make that connection. So we're gonna take just a moment right now and encourage you to go ahead and right now, click this QR code right here. There we go, there's the right one. So I wanna encourage you to go sign up right now. We'll give you a moment to do that if you want to. Or if you're old school, you can actually get up right now and go right back there and the sign up sheets are right there and you can sign up right at this moment or anytime during the service. This would be the appropriate time to do that if you want to. And I wanna encourage you, if you've not been a part of a small group, it's really simple. And this is where you're gonna learn whether you like this church or not. Okay, this is gonna really, really learn. Did you learn about the people here? And we get to know them. And we use the phrase a lot here in our church that we're all broken people living in a fallen world, sinners saved by grace. And that's where you get to learn what Jesus has done in the lives of other people. So I want to encourage you all, if you want to be a part of Fresno Church, okay, now there's a difference. You come here on Sunday morning, Fresno Church becomes your church. But if you're going to be a part of Fresno Church, the small groups is where it happens. So trust me on that. So be praying about that during the service. Think about it. We want you to be connected with that at some other point. All right, so having said that, last announcement is um, this afternoon, if you're involved with our Christ Helping Hands, that's our ministry to the homeless out at Roding Park. That happens. It meets at 1 o'clock. The feeding will start at 2 o'clock. And you can see uh, Cindy. Uh, we can, everybody just ask who Cindy is, and somebody will point to her at the end of the service and help you get involved with that at this point. Cindy's right now signing up for it. Look around, everybody. That's Cindy signing up for a small group right there right now, okay? Cindy is our volunteer minister of compassion here at the church, so you want to get to know Cindy, all right? So, again, keep that in mind. Sign up for small groups. We'd love to see everybody involved in one. There are six small groups to choose from, and if we need to start a seventh, we will just to make room for everybody, all right? So, that's enough of the announcements. Let's have a word of prayer, and then Hunter will come up to bring us God's word today. Father, thank you for this wonderful church. And, Father, I, I mean that seriously. I thank you for how uplifting it is to see your people gathered to see people making connections and to see lives changed. And now, Father, we pray that your hand may be upon your servant Hunter. As he has used his talent in leading our singing part, may worship truly continue as we learn about worship and we learn, Father, truly how important worship is to your heart. So guide our thoughts, our minds, our hearts together, Father, as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. It's good to see you guys. <clears throat> we're starting a new series today, which is exciting. And we're calling it What's Important to the Heart of God. And almost, where's the center? There's no center. Yeah, anyway. But it, we know Valentine's Day is in February, so... Don't trip. We, we are aware. But Donna did a good job on these screens, so I'm liking it. And a couple years ago, our church went through some tragedy, and uh, we switched some leadership and staff, and we are currently searching for a new uh, permanent senior pastor. And, and Daryl came on a couple years ago to help us seek the Lord uh, for our next step. And one of the things we did as a church is he got a bunch of us leaders together, and we sat around in a room, and we wanted to find out and identify who is Fresno Church? What, who are we as a church? Like, what are the core values the Holy Spirit has instilled in us? Um, there are things that are important to all churches everywhere, all God's people. But God does specific works in different churches. And so what is the specific work he's doing in our church? And we identified what we believe are eight core values that make Fresno Church what it is and what that identify what the Lord is doing here. These aren't the only things we value, but when we look at the landscape of all the things God has called us to, 
these seem to be the eight things that rise highest in the DNA of our church. And the first one is, like Daryl said, worship. Worship. And that's not, that's not singing. That's not what I'm talking about today. We're going to refer to that, what we just did. We praise the Lord in song. But that is not the core of what worship is. That's not necessarily what I'm focusing on today. Next week, Daryl's going to lead us in fellowship as a core value of who we are, Bible teaching, discipleship, prayer, missions, evangelism, and compassion. So these, over the next eight weeks, seven weeks now, this is week one. Well done. You're here. We're going to walk through these values and unpack what has the Lord called us to as a church. And so go take your Bible. I know it's on the screen, but I want to encourage you to grab a Bible nearby or your phone or whatever and go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, Deuteronomy chapter 10. When talking about worship, there's a lot of different verses you can look at. There's a lot of different passages we can go. And our normal practice here is what we, the style of preaching that we normally fall into is what's called expository. We take a passage and we focus primarily on that passage throughout the the sermon. I'm switching that up a bit today. It's going to be more topical. So we're not going to spend a lot of time in this passage, but we are going to read it to kind of give us a foundation to springboard us into this conversation, looking throughout the Bible at different passages that help us understand what worship is. Deuteronomy chapter 10, are you there? Amen. We're going to start in verse 12. Verse 12. The children of Israel are... They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, disobedient and rebellious to God, and they're finally at the point where they're ready to enter the promised land God called them to 40 years earlier. And Moses is going to die. God has told him, hey, Moses, you, you disobeyed me that time, and, and I said you're not going to enter the promised land, so you're not going to enter. Prepare the people to enter. And so Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible, is the final instructions of Moses to the children of Israel before they enter the land, the promised land. And this is what he says in chapter 10, verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways, to love him and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul? Keep the Lord's commands and statutes I'm giving you today for your own good. The heavens, indeed the highest heavens, belong to the Lord your God, as does the earth and everything in it. Yet the Lord had his heart set on your ancestors and loved them. He chose their descendants after them. He chose you out of all the peoples as it is today. And that can be said of you. If you are a believer in Christ, because of what Jesus has done, we have been grafted into the people of God. And now we, we get that title. You are the children of God if you believe in Christ. So that could be said of you. He chose you out of all peoples as it is today. Therefore, circumcise your hearts, cut off the flesh, and don't be stiff-necked any longer. But stiff-necked meaning you don't submit. But submit for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. The great, mighty, and awe-inspiring God, showing no partiality and taking no bribe. You can't make a deal with God. You can't get on His good side by doing something. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the resident alien, giving him food and clothing. You You are also to love the resident alien since you were resident aliens in the land of Egypt. You are to fear the Lord your God, and worship Him. Remain faithful to Him and take oaths in His name. He is your praise and He is your God who has done for you these great and awe-inspiring works your eyes have seen. Your ancestors went down to Egypt, 70 people in all, and now the Lord God has made you numerous like the stars of the sky. I'm going to pray in a minute. I want you to pray for me and I want you to pray for yourself and your own heart. But before we jump into this exploration of worship, here's the main point that's going to guide us through this time. That the ultimate purpose, now there's, we could say a lot of things, the purpose of our life is, you know, this or this or that, and we would be accurate. 
But I want to assert this morning something bold, that the ultimate purpose, that underneath all the other purposes, little p, is a big P purpose, and this is it, that the purpose of our lives on earth is to learn to worship God. You do realize that we will worship God for eternity, amen? Why in the world do we have to go through this 80, maybe, years, 60 to 80 years of a painful existence on earth if we're just going to worship God anyway for eternity? The ultimate purpose of our lives here on earth, church, is to learn to worship God. And that means to fear, to love, to praise God with all we are. And that's not true of any of us right now. We don't worship God with all we are. We don't. I don't. I don't worship God with all I am. I'd like to think I worship Him with most of who I am. But there's so much that God is still refining and cleaning and chopping off and changing and adding to my life to help me learn to worship Him with all I am. So pray with me. Father, You're so merciful, you're so good. Give us a sober-mindedness right now, a belief that you are here and you're ready to do something new in our lives. You're ready to do something new in this church. You're ready to give us understanding we haven't had before. And Father, my prayer is that after this message that your spirit would work through it so powerfully that afterwards our worship would be deeper. Our worship would be more fear-filled, more love-filled, and more praise-filled. Help your people, God. Please, don't let, don't let us deceive ourselves today by thinking that we already worship you good enough, that we already fear you and love you good enough. And therefore, we would twist the words to just fit what we already think rather than allowing them to cut us when they need to. Your word is a sword, God. And we need to be pierced today. And we need to be healed today. So Lord, would you do all of that in this time? May we see the power of the Spirit at work in our own hearts and in those sitting next to us in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let's talk about discovering worship. Discovering worship. This is first. So first, you already guessed it. The first part of worship is to fear God. To fear God. Um, In short, to fear the Lord is to take Him seriously. To fear the Lord is where God goes from an idea, a theory. He goes from an idea and a theory to actual reality. Have you ever experienced that in your life? where all of a sudden God became real. Maybe a show of hands, because I don't don't know. Amen, amen. And yeah, you don't need to lie. That shouldn't happen once. That's probably going to happen multiple times throughout our life. And as humans, we kind of think in fear only in negative terms, even if it produces a positive result. Like, um, I was thinking about this last night. If I go to Yosemite, how many of you have been to Yosemite in the valley? How many of you have seen pictures of Yosemite? I think that should be all of us. I think we've all seen them. Uh, There's several thousand foot cliffs in Yosemite. I think of Taft Point, and you can walk right up to the edge, and it's, you're dead. It's thousands of feet. A negative fear produces a positive result, doesn't it? You see what I'm saying? A negative fear of being hit by a car hopefully produces a positive result that our kids won't be. Amen. Amen? Amen. Amen. But that's not the kind of fear that is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is something so much more beautiful than that. How many of you like, enjoy roller coasters? Anyone? How many of you hate roller coasters? Okay. Some of you are going to get this, some of you not. But it's the closest thing I've come up with to really capturing as best I can what the fear of God is. 
If you go down to Six Flags, and I'm not talking little kitty roller coasters, I'm talking X2, I'm talking Goliath, I'm talking, you know, those roller coasters, the dark ones, right? Um, the big scary ones. The fear of God is not a fear that causes us to cower away from Him. If you don't know Christ, that is a right fear. You should cower away from God. You should be very afraid of God. You should respond like the demons. How do they respond to Jesus? Afraid of Him. Get away from us. Don't send me to the abyss. Send me to those pigs over there. Get me away. I know who you are. If you are not saved, if you don't know Christ, that is, that is right for you to fear God like that. But as children of God who have been made righteous, our fear is a fear that approaches with trembling. So as I approach X2 or Goliath and I'm walking up to the entrance, there's a nervousness, there's a fear, there's a, there's a trembling, there's, there's something going on. But the insane part of that is that I'm walking to it. Are you with me? I'm getting on the ride. I'm strapping in and I'm saying, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? And then I'm going tick, 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 tick. Ah, right? Exhilaration. That's fear. We don't call it that because we only think of fear in negative terms. But it's an awesome fear. It's a good fear. It's a wild ride. That's a little bit more like what the fear of God is. There's a life. There's a vibrance. There's an exhilaration to it. And there's, I was reading Luke 8 on Friday morning, and it had that story where the demons enter the pigs. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm going to cover it real quick. And there's a story right after it. So Luke 8, 37 and 47. So those are 10 verses apart. Um, the, the, the guy that's possessed with all the demons, right? The demons are like, oh, you know, send us into the pigs. The, they take the pigs off a cliff and, and die. The people of the town come out and they see the guy in his right mind, maybe for the first time, and they're like, what happened here? And what is their response? Then all the people of the Gerasene region asked him to what? Leave them because they were gripped by great fear. So getting into the boat, he returns. So Jesus doesn't protest. Jesus leaves. He obeys them. What does their fear do? It distances them from their Messiah. They just told God to walk away. Do you realize that? They saw something they didn't understand, and their response was, we don't like this, go away. However, 10 verses later, we meet the woman with the issue of blood. It's a humiliating sickness, especially in that culture. And she dares to believe that Jesus can heal her, so she goes and she touches the hem of his garment in the midst of a crowd. Jesus turns around and he says, who touched me? The disciples are like, everyone. Everyone's touching you. They're all around you. And he's like, no, someone touched me. And instead of running away, instead of running away trembling, the woman saw that she was discovered. She what? Say the word came. She came. Only two of you said it. Say the word came. Are you with me? Come on. She came trembling and fell down before him. That's our response. That's the response of faith. The response of faith says, I'm afraid and I'm coming towards him. Because what I fear is also what I love. He's also my father. He's the God of the universe, the God of wrath and judgment, and he's my dad. The fear of God. Next, which leads us right into the second thing, the love to love God. To worship is to love God. And most of us want to assume that we love God. You know what the problem is? Is on the journey of knowing God, you're going to discover some really sad news. Is that who you think God is, is not reality. And so when you are faced with those moments where the God you love is not the real God, you have to choose if you're going to continue to try to make that God God. Oh, no, no, he's the real God. I have to love him because I don't like this God. But unfortunately, this is the God of the Bible. So you either surrender and say, I love you. I don't understand this about you. I don't like what you're asking me to do. I don't like this aspect about you. But I humble myself and I want to love you. 
But a lot of us, we continue in a deception and we, oh, I just love God, I love God. And we don't realize we're just serving the idea of God. We love the idea of God. We love the, the version of God that we've created in our mind. He probably is similar to the real God of the Bible. But sanctification, becoming more like Jesus, when he sanctifies our worship, he makes our worship more pure, deep, and real, is continually seeing our misunderstandings of God and correcting and saying, no, this is the true God and I'm going to worship him. Do you understand? Some of you? That's okay. That's okay. You don't have to understand everything right now. John 4 Jesus is talking to the woman at the well in verse 23 and 24. He says this, But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. So, if you do not know Christ, if you are not saved, your worship means nothing. Say nothing. That's insulting to the world. If you are not, if you do not have the Spirit of God, you are spiritually dead and you are disconnected from God. It's that simple. We don't like it, but it's that simple in terms of Scripture. So your worship is a false worship. But when you have the Spirit of God, you have one part of the equation. You're worshiping in spirit. To worship in truth is what the Spirit does. He brings your worship into alignment with reality. Are you with me? Come on. That's a word. He brings your worship in line with reality so that when you worship God, it's more and more and more accurate to who He is. Your understanding is more accurate. Sometimes we worship in ignorance, and that's okay. In, in fact, to some degree, every single one of us worships in ignorance today. Do you fully understand God? Well, few people are honest. Do you fully understand God? No. So some of our worship is ignorance, and you know what? That's where it's faith in the Spirit. Lord, you're going to continue to show me who you are, but right now, I'm not going to wait to praise you. I'm going to praise you now, and I'm going to trust you that it's not about my worship. My worship, our worship, our love is only a response to God. We respond to who God is. We behold who God is in His Word. We behold God and His work in each other. We behold his work in us, we behold his love, we behold the cross, the gospel story of what Jesus has done for us, and we respond with thanksgiving. We respond with worship, we respond with love, right? This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. Our love is a response to the love of God. Do you see that? So, what is love? I, I just, I literally, that's not in there. I just, it was the next words, and I was like, just sing it. All right, John 15, 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commands. So love is not just a feeling. Isn't the feeling nice? How many of you have felt love for God? How many of you have felt love for God? Amen. Amen. That's not a bad thing, y'all. I feel love for my wife. But if that's all my love is, I'm missing, I'm missing a lot. Because Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So obedience is what proves that those feelings are not just feelings. But there's a foundation to them. Are you with me? Um, let's go down to 1 John 5, 3a. I'm going to move a little faster here. He, he defines it again, for this is what love for God is, to keep his commands. Are you nailing all the commands of Jesus? Good, no hands, good. Me and Ray have been reading Romans at night, and, and you know the commands of Paul are still the commands of Jesus? They're, they're in unity, it's all his word. You understand that, you with me? So we're not just talking, what does Jesus say in the Gospels? But the, the encouragements and admonitions of Paul to love one another, to detest evil, to honor governing authorities, somebody testify. Right? How we do in church, are we keeping his commands? And we'd like to say mid, 
maybe. I'm trying. And so it's not, I don't want to make this time about how much do you love God. Because He has to give you all of that love. He is the one who gives us that love. But it is to, to reach brokenness. To say, I'm not loving you well enough, God. And I can't. You've got to do that work in me. Help me love you. Help me see your love for me. And, and here's, here's the deal, guys. Put this on the screen, Sheldon, this next. Loving God will cost you what? Don't raise your hands, but do you believe that? And I don't mean he'll take away everyone you love, he'll take away all your possessions. I mean, maybe. Anyone know someone like that? Job? Yeah, right? How about that? But it does mean as you get closer to God and as you seek to love him, you're going to explore and you're going to see the warring within you of loves. So much of what you're going through, maybe the suffering in your life, your marriage, your family, your work, whatever it is, so much of it could be a battle of worship, a battle of loves. I love this, but I love God. I love God, but I love this too. And we want to try to make those things work, work together. And when you really love God, you realize all the other things you love. And instead of making God in your own image, we have to humble ourselves and lay that down. Loving God will cost you everything. I like, I don't want to move forward too fast because you need to sit with that. So we fear God, we love Him, and we praise Him. You know, praise, this is maybe the aspect more where we think of singing, and that's accurate. To praise God is the outward display, it is the outward demonstration of the work He's doing in us, and of the worship, the fear, the love. It is the then outward response. It is a bursting forth. How many of you have seen me burst forth up here? When I, I'm not trying to get cheers, but you know what I'm saying? It's like I'm here, and then sometimes I burst right in your faces, into the mic, but then other times I'll just go. It's a bursting forth. It's a, it's a passion that you're, you're, you're seeing who God is. You're seeing what He's done for you, and it just, you explode. You explode with praise. And I could go to so many passages. We could just take an hour and look at psalm after psalm and other passages. We could see Paul. You could see Paul explode. When you're reading Paul, watch the times where he's just, oh, he just stopped and he just, he burst. Paul's describing some of the hardest theology in Romans 11. And then he just stops and he bursts. And he's like, oh, the depth of the riches. Both the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his ways. And he just blows up. He blows up with praise. Look at Psalm 150. Hallelujah. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him for his abundance. How would you read this? How would you read this? Right? Praise him with the blast of a ram's horn. Praise him with a harp and lyre. Praise him with a tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything... That breathes. Praise the Lord. And then just for good measure. Hallelujah. It's a bursting forth. And again, to burst forth in praise is not, it doesn't require feelings. It requires faith. Because when you can Walk away from your feelings for a sec. Because some of you feel like garbage this morning, right? Some of you feel like garbage. So many Sundays, I just feel like garbage. I wake up, and I don't know what's going on. And it's just like, all right. He's worthy anyway. Amen? He's worthy of the same. He's still worthy. So I'm going to burst forth and feel like I'm coming in half. Because this side wants to be in bed, and this side, the Holy Spirit in me, is saying, but he's worthy, right? But he's worthy, right? 
And guess what? The spirit is stronger than your flesh. Amen? Some of you need to believe that. The spirit in you, the spirit of God, is stronger than the flesh. Stronger than whatever your flesh is feeling. And so you can burst forth based on truth, acting on truth. That's faith. I act on truth. I'm acting according to what I believe is true. That's faith. You understand? I'm acting according to what I believe is true. If I believe God is worthy, if I believe he's good, if I believe he's great, then I don't feel that and I don't understand how I could not feel that. I'm saying it and I'm not, I don't get it, but I'm going to burst forth because I'm leaving this in his hands and I'm going to trust him. So we've discovered worship a little bit, hopefully. We've discovered. But now I want to talk about enriching worship. Enriching. Because we discover worship. I mean, when we're saved... We discovered worship. The Holy Spirit was in us and we were responding to God. And we said, Lord, I give you my life. Worship. Ascribing worth to God. Amen? But as we are sanctified, as we continue going through life, God doesn't just rapture us immediately. He leaves us on this earth. Amen? How many many of you left you here after he saved you? (laughs) Man, there's not a lot of saved people in this church. Lord, help us. Still here. I didn't go to heaven yet. God left me here. He's going to enrich, and he has been enriching my worship. And let me tell you this. Only the suffering and darkness I have known. Are you listening? Because this is not fun. Only the suffering and darkness I have known could teach me to worship God like I do now. You know, I learned a lot of theology. I've taken a lot of classes, watched a lot of YouTube, been to school. And that's great, and it's greater after suffering. Because that's when you really learn. Did Job worship God before his life was destroyed. He worshipped him before his life was destroyed. Look what Job says at the end of his life. He says, I had heard reports about you. Anyone heard reports about God? Y'all, your hands are tired. You're like, oh, done. Done with this. Stop asking me to put my hands up. James is like, I had heard reports about you. This is the end. This is after. God shows up. Job has been wrestling. He's accusing God. He's frustrated. He's crying. He's hopeless. He's having hope. And then he's hopeless again. He's going through the the thralls of life, the groaning of life for us all to see. He's in the glass case, and we're all just watching this insanity unfold. God shows up. And Job says, I heard reports about you, but now, everyone say, but now. But now, but now my eyes have seen you. You know what that but now is? Suffering. The presence of God in suffering. But now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I reject my words and I am sorry for them. All my arguments, everything I thought you were, everything, whatever, I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm sorry. I am dust and ashes. It's worship, church. Brokenness, humility before the Lord. Who is he talking to? Talking to God. He's not putting on a show for us. He's talking to the Lord. He don't even know we're here. You know, the greatest demonstration of worship, though, this may confuse you at first, but follow me here. The greatest demonstration of worship in the history of the world was Jesus dying on the cross. Here's here's what I mean. To say Jesus worshipped God sounds a little weird because he's God. Did Jesus pray? Did Jesus obey? Did Jesus humble himself? Did Jesus submit to the Father? This is like a song. Throw a beat on this. Somebody like, come on, that's good. That's good right there. Jesus was the perfect man. The perfect man. He perfectly feared God, perfectly loved God, perfectly praised God, perfectly worshipped. What did we look at in Philippians 2 a few weeks ago with Daryl? That's where we've been the past few weeks. 
Paul, Paul says, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death in the most humiliating way. Listen to this. Let this sink in. Jesus, I'm not trying to be hyperbolic or exaggerate here, okay? Jesus worshiped the Father to death. What? Jesus obeyed his Father to death. And he says, take up your cross and follow me. Who are we following? Yikes. And Paul, the next chapter of Philippians, Philippians 3, some of my favorite scripture. He says in verse 7, I don't have it on the screen, 7, 7 through 10, 11. And he's like, I want to be like him. I want to be, he uses this word, I think in the CSB, conformed to his death. I want to be like him on the cross. I want to be that submitted, that worshipful. I want to love God that much. I want to fear God that much. I want to obey God to that degree. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what Paul's saying? That's worship. He's worth that. Because when you go through suffering and you praise God, it proclaims much louder, he's worth it. He's worth it. When our brothers and sisters are dying across the world, being kicked out of their villages, estranged from their family, beaten, put in prison and forgotten in some shipping container in Eritrea, people don't know if they're dead or alive. What is that? That's sick. What is that man on the cross? That's sick. Just come down already. You don't get it. You don't get it. The suffering of man proclaims the worthiness of God. That he is worthy of my suffering. What's coming for me is so much better. I will endure because he's with me. He's good. He's better. So are you honest with yourself today? None of us should come to the end of this message impressed by ourselves. My worship is good. I'm loving God great. We've got a long way to go, don't we? And God is so good. God's not up there, arms folded, tapping his foot like, you love me? No. He's pouring love on us right now. He's pouring mercy and grace. That's why we respond and we're just like, wow. The older I've gotten, the more I follow Christ, the more I'm just like, wow. It doesn't get old, it gets new. It gets newer. Because I'm just like, you're still gracious. You're still merciful. And I just see how disgusting my flesh is. I see the carnage that sin has wrecked in my heart. My worship of other things. My tactics of manipulation and, and looking good for people. And, you know, pursuing what my heart, what my flesh is craving. And God's like, yeah, I've known that all along. And I love you. I knew it better than you. I know your flesh your sin, I know it all better. You know, I, I know how bad it's going to be at the end of your life. Like, I know it all, Hunter, and I love you. Beholding God produces worship. So, where do we go from here? Here's where I want to start. If you want to close your eyes for just a sec, I'm gonna, we're going to open them in a minute, but just close your eyes for a second. I want you to ask the Lord in your heart. You can say it out loud, but just maybe in your heart means more. Say, Lord, please teach me to worship you. Lord, please teach me to worship you. And I, when, I, when I say suffering teaches, I'm not just talking about, you know, crazy suffering. I'm talking about traffic. Traffic is suffering. I hate it. And you're like, Hunter, you're so petty. It's like, I know. Stop judging me. It's life. But then there's the bigger suffering, right? There's the miscarriage. There's the cancer. There's the loss of a family member. That stuff is, you know, it's, it's in, incomprehensible. It, it, we don't even know how to handle it. In all of it, God is teaching us to worship. Next, remove from your life what leads your heart away from worship. Nothing in my life leads me away from worship, Hunter. Nothing. 
Some of you are like, my spouse? Come on. That's a word. You know there are idiots who have followed their desire by that kind of thinking? That's not what I'm talking about right there. Nothing can make you not worship God. Are you with me? Definitely not a person. So I'm not talking about your boss. I'm not talking about your spouse. I'm not talking about your neighbor. No. What's in your heart? What's in your heart? What do you love that leads you away from worshiping God? Lord, help us remove those things. And then next, make space in your life for worship. Make space in your life for worship. Make space to behold God, to be with God, to find a true fear of Him, to sit in His love for you, to meditate on the wonder and mystery of who He is. Make space. This is why we read the Word. This is why we have our devotional time, because I need to make space to find worship. Because I'll tell you what, when I get out of bed first thing in the morning, I ain't feeling worship. Number four, begin to see the troubles of life as instruments to help you worship God. How many of you know how to play an instrument? Okay, I'm recruiting right now. <laughs> We're all going to talk after this. Rip, what do you play? Saxophone? Baritone. Close. It's close. That's the big one, right? No, I'm thinking tuba. Yeah. When you're learning an instrument, it's very tedious, monotonous, and like most people don't make it. You start learning an instrument, and you're like, ah, I'm done with this. It's like, what? This is not what I thought. I'm not shredding on the guitar. I'm not sounding good. Anyone, anyone tried to learn violin in here? That's a hard one. You don't make it very far. You're like, no, nah, we're done. It don't sound right. Begin to see the troubles of your life as instruments to help you worship God. Because what is the result of committing to learning an instrument? It's beauty. It's art. Going through the monotony. Going through the tediousness. That's suffering. That's life. View these things. And it's so hard. You're like, oh. View these things as instruments to help you worship God. The ultimate purpose of our lives on earth is to learn to worship God, to fear, to love, to praise God with all we are. Church, that is not a, uh, for some of you, that's a radical, radical shift if you would allow God to do it in you this morning. In the way you go to work, in the way you take care of your kids, in the way you drive, in the way everything, in the way you eat, the way you get up in the morning. Life, I'm supposed to learn how to worship God today. It's like, I'm learning to worship God at church on Sundays. No, all your life. I want to end with this. I've gone long as usual. That's what I do. Um, how many of you got this when you came in? Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up. Wave it around. All right. Stop being weird. <laughs> on the back, small group discussion. This is this week. When we get into small groups, and I'm judging all y'all because I don't think most of y'all signed up. Just sign up. You don't have to come. Just sign up. If you don't feel like coming that day, don't come, right? But at least take a chance and say, God, I'm going to sign up. You better make me go. Otherwise, I'm not. Get into fellowship, church. Allow the Lord to speak through other believers. And I want to go through a couple of these questions, and then we're going to have an immediate application of bursting forth in praise to God to end our service. That's why we only did one song at the beginning. So I hope some of you were, felt kind of gypped. You're like, ah, one song. All right. Look at question three. What have you worshipped in the past? What are some things you are afraid of? And I'm not talking, oh, I'm afraid of sharks. If you come to group and you're trying to get the right answers and you're trying to Look okay, look impressive, look like you're a good Christian. It's, you're, you're, you're missing the entire point. We come because we need God. 
And so we come with honesty and vulnerability and we say, this is really where I'm at. What did I used to worship in the past? Hunter used to worship himself. It's pretty sick. Hunter used to worship himself. I wanted to be this. And, and, and my dreams of serving God were all about me. Hunter worshiped entertainment. So what have you worshiped in the past? Next, uh, four. Where do you see the fear of God show up in your heart and life? For some of you, the honest answer to that is, right now, nowhere. And that's, you can be honest. Like, for me to hear that, I would prefer to hear that over like whatever the best responses are in the room because that's what God's after. He's after brokenness, humility, and I need you, God. I need you. Now don't try to fake that because the Lord will, the Lord will find you and he'll, he'll show you, he'll expose you that that's fake. You're not really desperate. You're just trying to fake it because now that's the new good thing. And then look at the last one. What is one way God is trying to grow your worship of him? So, ladies, come back up. Let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, just, I thank you. I praise you. You're working in spite of me. You're working in spite of us. There's no superheroes here. There's no, there's no one good. It's just you, and we're all in need of you right now. We're all broken. But we're going to turn our attention away from ourselves. And we're just, we're going to turn it on you for the next 10, 15 minutes. And we're just going to think about you. We're going to abandon our inhibitions and our fear. And we're going to praise you. We're going to burst forth. Because you're worthy. We don't need to burst forth so someone next to us will think, oh, we really got something out of the message. We're spiritual. Lord, just get our eyes on you right now. Have mercy on us. Break through the clouds of this world and our flesh and the voices inside our head and that we might see what our God has done for us and who he is and his love and how there's no one that can, there's no one who can battle God. There's no one who can defy God. He's in control of everything. The heavens and the highest heavens are his, like Moses said in Deuteronomy. So Lord, would you receive would you receive the worship of your people right now? Would you bless it, Lord? As your word says, would you inhabit the praises of your people in the name of Jesus? We thank you. Come on, let's stand.
Glorious, you are glorious. 
Lord, you are the most glorious. I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your arms, unashamed because of mercy. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain, praise when I'm sure, and praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered, praise when surrounded, cause praise is my enemies drowning as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord oh my soul praise the Lord oh my soul Praise when I don't I'll praise cause I know You're still in control My praise is a weapon Oh, it's more than a sound, yeah My praise is the shout That brings Jerry down as long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to praise the Lord oh my soul praise the Lord oh my soul oh I won't be quiet my God is alive, how could I keep it inside? Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I'll praise cause you're faithful Praise cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater than you I'll praise cause you're sovereign Praise cause you reign Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I'll praise cause you're faithful Praise cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater than
quiet. I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? No, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? No, I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? apologize. Don't ever let me play guitar after preaching again. Amen. Y'all were doing great. I could not find the rhythm, but hey, we praise the Lord. We burst it forth. Praise God. Get out of here. Sign up for a group. Sign up for a group, and we'll see you guys this week. Amen. Amen.